probably almost everybody in the audience. So Michael Sinatra is a senior network engineer with ESNet. He formerly was a senior network engineer with Berkeley and uh, has been a member of the HPR and DC tax, uh, somehow managed to escape being a chair. Please welcome Michael Sinatra. I'm going to live that one down, am I? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> So I, I still have a little bit of a frog in my voice, and I apologize for that. Start off with. Uh, this presentation is sort of two presentations, two parts. We're going to talk a little bit about science DMZ security best practices. Most of that work was done by Nick Borrelio. And <clears throat> then we're going to talk a little bit about how to integrate the science DMZ into the overall security architecture of your network, which uh, I think it, it gives you some opportunities to actually increase the overall security of your network. And uh, Nick is not here. Um, he did co-author this, um, but he will be represented in this presentation by this pack of Oreos. So that's going to be his. Um, it, it, it is a running joke between me and Nick. So that's so if Nick is watching. Nick, if you're watching on the stream, I apologize. They're not double stuff. So um, I'll let you read the motivations on the screen. And I'm going to say one sort of thing that um, I think a lot of people, a lot of people sort of ask about science DMZ security, and I get, kind of get the feeling that what people want me to do here is present the sort of magic cookie, the magic um, pixie dust recipe that you can sprinkle on your science DMZ and it's going to make it secure. Or at least you can sprinkle the pixie dust on your security officer and then the security officer will think that your science DMZ is secure. And I think that, you know, so there, look, there's no pixie dust that you're going to be able to sprinkle on your network in general to make it secure. And if you think that firewalls are that magic pixie dust, then you're probably not going to like this presentation very much because it's not going to go into the fact that you can just put one thing on, or you can just do one thing, and it's not going to be, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint right off the bat, SDN's not quite going to save us. It may help us, but it's not going to save us. So <clears throat> I want to go into... Uh, just a couple of myths about the Science DMZ before I get started. This is a pet peeve of mine. Um, ESNet actually didn't invent the Science DMZ. We invented the concept of the Science DMZ, with the exception of Eli Dart. Eli actually did, I think, a lot of work at NERSC when he was an employee of NERSC, not an employee of ESNet, to, in building out NERSC's data door uh, networks. But for the most part, what we did is took, looked at what was working. So when you say things like, okay, well, now that you guys have invented the science DMZ, you need to invent some security for it. Um, we looked at what was working out there. And what was working out there was, was, was a set of practices that involved a lot more than just things like not having a firewall in place, which brings us to the next myth, which is the goal of the science DMZ is to route around firewalls and other security controls. This really bugs me a lot <clears throat> because it leads to all sorts of pathological conclusions, like, for example, our network doesn't have a firewall at the border, therefore our whole network is a science DMZ. And that makes me say things like, well, you mean the part of your network that's behind three routers, two switches, and seven fiber patch panels away from your border route? That's not really a science DMZ, because what the science DMZ is really trying to do is what's written on the screen here. It's actually trying to match, in the case of security, it's trying to match the security controls with the thing that you're trying to protect while maximizing the performance and functionality of that thing. And that's what we're going to talk about here. One of the ways we're going to achieve this over time is to separate functions. If we can separate functions, then we can do things like reducing the number of unknown unknowns using the Rumsfeld typology. Um, and in doing that, it allows us to provide finer grain controls but they don't have to do things like deep packet inspection. You don't have to try to figure out what the system is doing because you're running the system. You actually know what it's doing, or you have other ways of knowing what it's doing. So it's telling me I haven't packed up in a couple of days. It is a really paranoid. <clears throat> uh, so basically, this is Nick's vision of what a lot of networks look like. I think this is what the UC uh, Irvine network actually looks like. Like there's border firewalls right in there. You can see them right, right over here. And then there's IDS connected to it. And of course, there be dragons. Now Nick's vision of what the science DMZ looks like is just another pathway into the network. And then you have a science DMZ cluster, like a cluster of DTNs somewhere inside there. Um, and when I mean inside there, it's sort of down in here is where your cluster of DTNs is. 
I'm going to show some examples of science DMZs that look a little bit more like some of the things that Eli has shown over the years, where you have a specific enclave that is the science DMZ and that connects directly to the border router outside of any firewall. A lot of you have these open networks, and you can see how your security officers love those. It's not just there be dragons, but it's here, there, and everywhere be dragons. This is a, a sort of typical open network where you have a 100 gig um, connection. The important thing is, if you actually look at the history of computer security in higher ed, people have been able to secure these kinds of networks. A lot of you run these kinds of networks. A lot of you run open networks, and you've been able to secure them. And one of the things is to remember here is these networks are not without firewalls. It's not there aren't firewalls. It's that these enclaves down here have their own firewalls. This may be the administrative enclave. This may be the student system. So they're all going to have separate firewalls or separate security control mechanisms security control suites, if you will, that are basically going to be tailored to what they're trying to do. And that's what we want to do with the Science DMZ also. Now, in this case, you have Nick, Nick's vision is you, you can start tapping your Science DMZ, and there's a bunch of other stuff you can do. And Nick goes into a whole bunch of things about, um, you know, really, what, what do you want to do with the security in the Science DMZ, and what do you want your best practices to look like? But they should actually look a lot like your best practices that you already run on your network. You don't need to throw everything away because you're doing things a little bit differently in the science DMZ, you can still do things a lot the same as you do in the rest of your, uh, in the rest of your network in terms of security and the rest of your system. Um, I do want to point out logistically that the uh, PDFs that I have on the web right now are not, do not have the notes, a bunch of notes that go with this. I'll make the PowerPoints available. If the senior uh, folks can put it on the website, they can do that, or I can make the PowerPoints available elsewhere, and you can read through them. And they actually have a lot of notes. I'm going to gloss over some of these things and skip through them just for the, you know, in the interest of time to make sure that we cover all the, the points that I want to cover. <clears throat> so basically, you don't have to throw away things in your own network. We're not, we are not not blocking traffic. We are still going to block traffic. We're going to use router ACLs to do it. So the notion that we don't have a firewall, a dedicated firewall, doesn't mean that we're not actually out there actively blocking traffic. And in fact, I would argue we're going to block traffic in both directions. You want to protect the science DMZ from stuff outside of your network and from stuff inside your network, because you might have you know, 50,000 of your best friends may not all be your best friends. You might have some systems in your network you want to protect the science DMZ from. You also want to protect the, the network from the science DMZ. You don't want to have the science DMZ have access to your entire campus network. The science DMZ probably doesn't need to get to your financial system, for example. So you can actually ACL that off at the science DMZ level. So again, we don't stop doing ACLs. <clears throat> um, and I basically covered this. So I still think that software patching is the single best way of securing systems. I know patching sometimes is hard, and we're going to get into some of the ways that the Science DMZ can help you with that. Um, but in the case of a Science DMZ, a data transfer node, a perf center node, all these hosts have or you know, run up-to-date software that's very patchable. You should be designing your science DMZ in a way that allows for maximum patching, updating, keeping everything up-to-date. You shouldn't create a lot of custom software, a lot of custom tools on your science DMZ that makes patching difficult. So as you design the security into the network as you build it, you want to try to put it, make it sure that that's one of your goals, is that you be able to patch systems pretty much automatically not have to worry about things like certain types of software breaking or somebody's scripts not working after that. I really like host-based firewalls, and host-based firewalls do have a, a place in the Science DMZ. It is possible that host-based firewalls can cause some performance issues. I'm really interested, and this is kind of a forward-looking thing, but I'm really interested in building best practices for host-based firewalls and high-performance networks. That's something I'm doing within ESNet. That's a project I'm going to be undertaking in the next few months. So. I'm hoping to have some, some collaborations on that, you know, and, and some, maybe some best practices available on, on that in the next few years. Many of you already manage your networks centrally, or you manage your system centrally. You have Ansible, or CF Engine, or Puppet, or Chef. Those tools, you don't need to not use them in your Science DMZ, you know, just because, again, there are certain things you're doing differently. doesn't mean you don't need to already have central management. If you have central management, that's what you ought to be doing. And just like patching, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do at the host layer to lock things down. There's a lot of IDS options like Tripwire, OSSEC. There are also mechanisms within operating systems like Linux and BSD to 
that allow you to do things like lock down binary and make it so that even root can't modify binaries unless the system goes into single user mode. And that can only happen you know, in certain ways. You can actually specify that. So mandatory access controls like SE Linux. I know when I, as soon as I say SE Linux, a lot of people are going to start groaning because it looks really hard and really complicated. But there are mechanisms like SE Linux that implement mandatory access control. FreeBSD also has mandatory access control. So there's a variety of operating systems that implement these kinds of things that allow you to specify who can do what in a broader level than just simple things like Unix permission. Not that you should ignore Unix permission, but you can do a lot of other different things with that. So both locking down of binaries and also the uh, mechanism by which you either use Tripwire or OSSEC or something like that. Now, that also complicates your patching because when you patch something, Tripwire is going to say, hey, this thing's changed. So you have to be, you know, you have to be able to, to, to manage those trade-offs. And that is one of the things that's going to be a little bit of a challenge in a science DMZ type thing when you've got a DTN that's out there on the network. Um, we talk about user accountability. This is really just, you know, where do you let where do you funnel your users through and what kind of accounting do you do for them? And there's some pretty good notes on this, and I'll just let you read that. I'm, I'm not I'm not going to go too much into that. If you do central logging, um, then your Science DMZ can do central logging. So all the hosts in the Science DMZ, the DTNs, the Sonar boxes, they can all do central logging as well. And if you don't do central logging, why? Why not? And that, you know, again, when you ask me about Science DMZ security, it's like, well, what are your security best practices in other parts of your network? And if you're not doing it in other parts of your network, then why are you thinking that, well, Science DMZ should be any different? And again, if you think it's just because it doesn't have a firewall, then you should really be looking at the wide range of security best practices you have, because that needs to be rounded out probably a little bit more. You can't put all your eggs in the firewall basket. Um, I won't talk too much about confidentiality, just because I talk a little bit about crypto later on. But you know, using secure protocols, using cryptographic hashes, that kind of stuff. Uh, I know I realize some software still a lot of the tools we use still use MD5 hashes. It's really a good idea if it's available to move to SHA2, which is SHA256, 384, and 512. Those algorithms, um, because MD5 has known hash collisions and they're actually exploitable, so it'd be actually good to move on to at least SHA1, if not SHA2. SHA1 has theoretical hash, hash collisions, but they haven't been exploited yet, so it actually is good to move on to SHA2. Um, obviously, the IDS you're going to use for your <clears throat> network IDS is going to be very important. And we, you know, we talk a lot about Bro, we talk a lot about putting Bro in a high performance, non inline configuration. The good news is that Vince is going to talk for about an hour about that stuff in the next session. So I don't really need to do it. You can refer mostly to his uh, session. And I've looked at his slides, and they're really good. It's practically a tutorial. So it's actually really worth taking a look at that. But you're still going to do intrusion detection. You're still going to do a lot of the other best practices that you'd be doing in your network. And if you're going to do intrusion detection, then you also need to take action. You need to do the sort of IPS function. How do you stop that? Do you use black hole routing? Do you use PGP flow spec? Those are all really, really cool technologies. Um, in, in the case of flow spec, it, it gives you the opportunity to use BGP in the way that you use black hole routing. However, you can use it to manage ACLs on your router in a more fine-grained way than you otherwise could simply with black hole routing. Black hole routing is all or nothing. You turn the host on, you turn it off. With flow spec, it actually allows you to put finer-grained ACLs the same way you would manage ACLs on a router, except you do it in a BGP NLRI. You do it using BGP updates. So <clears throat> this is really good stuff. If you don't know much about um, BGP flow spec, there is the RFC. There were a couple of talks about it at Nanog, the most recent Nanog, which was Nanog 63. And if you look up on the Nanog website, you'll be able to find information about flow specs. So there's actually some pretty cool stuff going. Nick talks a lot about black hole routing. Um, I don't remember if, if Vince actually talks about this too much. But if you do black hole routing on your, um, on your regular network, this is a great way to put it. If you have a dedicated Science DMZ router, make sure that your dedicated Science DMZ router is peering with your black hole router so that you can protect your Science DMZ and also protect the rest of the network from your Science DMZ should something go horribly wrong. Here you can see a little anime, well, a little blending of what actually happens when you try to um, 
when somebody tries to do something bad to your network and you can use the black hole router, combine with the intrusion detection system to rapidly block that signal. This talks more, again more about BGP flow specs, so I won't go into it any further. Now, baselines. Uh, this is, I think, Nick's idea of um, a way of getting it up into the right graph sneaked into this presentation. Um, but the idea here is that you simply want to make sure you know what your network looks like on a normal day so that you know what an abnormal day is. Again, these are basic concepts. You're not doing anything differently than what you ought to be doing in the rest of your network. That page intentionally left blank. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about IPv6 for a few minutes because um, there's some interesting things that come out of making sure that IPv6 is enabled on your science DMZ. And by the way, I do want to say I'm kind of disappointed that there's no IPv6 on the wireless network here at the meeting. Um, that's, I don't know, it, just, it feels like IPv6 is, is at a place now where it just works. And in fact, in the research community, we are kind of bringing up the rear now in IPv6. Um, broadband networks are doing it. Content distribution networks are doing it. And in some cases, there are research facilities in other countries that are doing IPv6. In some cases, they're only doing IPv6. In other cases, their reachability and throughput is better over IPv6 than it is over IPv4. So the example that we have in ESNet for this is General Atomics is in a collaboration with the East facility in China. Those are both tokamaks. And in order to manage the not only the data coming back from the tokamak, but actually to manage the tokamak itself. Uh, General Atomics needed to implement IPv6 because the connectivity and the throughput was much better over IPv6 than it was over IPv4. It was not really even serviceable over IPv4. So this was a case where they needed to put in IPv6. Otherwise, they didn't get the work done that they needed to get done. This is going to happen more often. And if you don't have it in your network, at least put it in your science DMZ because that's going to give you the opportunity to bring data in from places that you might not otherwise be able to bring the data in. Now, you might say that example is kind of, you know, I bet that's probably a one-off. It actually turns out, if you look at some of the work that's being done in the commercial sector, um, <clears throat> it is increasingly the case that for people in a wide variety of commodity internet environments, IPv6 now performs better than IPv4. And it doesn't take much to understand why that is, because a lot of what's where IPv4 is, a lot of IPv4 is going through NAT. And it might be going through multiple NATs. And I think it was J.J. Jameson of um, Juniper said, well, you know, maybe it's just like TSA PreCheck. It's because nobody's using it right now. Nobody, you know, the line's always short because nobody's there. And I, I pointed out to him that <clears throat> I had just been in Pittsburgh <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd just been in Pittsburgh, and the TSA pre-check line was longer than the regular line. But we still got through faster, because we didn't have to take all our crap off, and we didn't have to put it back on. Now think about what NAT does. That's exactly what it does. It puts a bunch of stuff onto the packet, and it takes a bunch of stuff off. It's just, it's just reverse TSA. So you have to spend all this time in line, because everyone's putting all their crap back on and taking it all off. Well, pre-check lets you avoid that. IPv6 is like the TSA pre-check of IP. It lets you avoid doing all the extra stuff. So even if you have a longer queue in IPv6, you're going to get processed faster. OK, <clears throat> I'm going to take a, a little drink of water, and I'm going to cue the angelic choir, because now it's time to talk about SDN. And this is the thing that's going to save us all, right? So <clears throat> somehow that actually didn't work very well in terms of getting my throat clear. Um, so this is what everyone thinks is going to be the magic dust. This is what everyone thinks is going to be the thing that's going to say, oh, can't we just put SDN in the science DMZ, and that'll fix that whole firewall problem. All right, so number one, the whole firewall problem is our mentality about the firewall problem that we think that we need the firewall as a necessary and sufficient condition to have security. That's problem number one. And if we just did something else technological like SDN, that would just replace the firewall, just be a drop-in replacement. Um, now, 
obviously I'm thinking that, that that's a little bit unrealistic and that we're going to have a sort of pit of despair, trough of despair, whatever Gartner calls that thing, that when we realize that that's not exactly what SDN does, it is going to help us, but it, it, it's not going to actually do all those things. But I do have two visions for what SDN can do in this particular use case. One is a traditional open flow, open switch, white box type uh, environment where you have an open flow, open flow controller and a switch with multiple outputs. And the controller looks at IDS data or looks at some aspect of the flow, attempts to identify it as an elephant flow or as a trusted data flow, and routes it around the firewall through a very fast link into your DTN with no nothing in between. And then if, it, if it's not trusted or it doesn't know what it is, then it can put it through a more deep packet inspection style firewall. Um, the other possibility is you just have a really big fancy deep packet inspection style firewall which has a fast lane embedded in it. The part of it actually just looks like a really fast router and the other part is the deep packet inspection firewall. And then there's some secret sauce that the vendors put in that looks a lot like OpenFlow or sort of an OpenFlow-ish, SDN-ish thing. It allows you to route around the, the deep packet inspection portion and go through the fast lane to get to your science DMZ or get to your DTN. And these are actually being done. I'm pretty sure that both Juniper and Palo Alto and a few other um, vendors are probably doing these, or probably working on these right now. In fact, actually I actually know that, that some of them are working on them now. And we actually do have working implementations of some of this stuff. But again, the problem is identifying the flows that should go in the fast path and treating those in a, such a way that um, not only do they perform well, but they are reliable. And that's sort of the rub. I think there are going to be two problems here. One is you need that secret sauce. You need the stuff that's going to be able to tell you whether this is a good flow or whether this is a bad flow. There's a lot of research being done in this and a lot of work being done in this, but it's not clear that anyone has come up with the de definitive recipe. You could do something really simple like say, well, you know, there are all these other known DTNs out there, and if the traffic's coming from them, I'm just going to route it through the fast path. Assuming that those known DTNs never get compromised, there's never a problem with that. Um, or that nobody can sort of spoof the known DTN or try to do something else to make it look like this is actual science data traffic. You can also try to identify elephant flows versus mouse flows, but somebody could make a malicious flow that looks an awful lot like an elephant flow and tricks your, your machine into going around that, your, your SDN machine, state machine into going around the firewall. There is work being done. The HINTS project that ESNet and the University of Virginia are working on uh, actually does try to characterize elephant flows versus mice, mouse flows. That is more in the sense of trying to use open flow type mechanisms to first identify the, well, first you identify the flows, then you use potentially open flow type mechanisms to route those big elephant flows into links that can handle the elephant flow traffic. So, the point is that none of this stuff is completely done yet, and it's not fully baked. And I'm not sure it will ever be baked enough that we can use it in a way that doesn't require a lot of care and feeding. And part of the goal of the Science DMZ is to try to eliminate some of that care and feeding stuff. So I see two problems. One is we don't really have the secret sauce yet. We're working on it. We're getting there. But we don't really have the secret sauce yet. And the other problem is you're still going to be putting a layer of complexity on top of your Science DMZ that is going to add to the things that can go wrong. It's going to add to the troubleshooting time it's going to take for you to get something. If, if there's a data flow that's not performing well, well, why is it not performing well? Is it getting mischaracterized and put in, and shunted into the wrong path? That's going to be one of the first things you're going to have to look at. So it's an extra layer of complexity that you didn't have before. And I, I, I just we can talk about this some more. I'm just not so sure that we are actually you know, sort of adhering to the spirit of the science DMZ, which is really about trying to remove degrees of freedom, simplify the design, and make sure that we don't have as much that can go wrong, and we don't have as much that can troubleshoot. That we have to troubleshoot. Thanks. OK. Um, the, the goal, of course, is to collaborate not only on, provide collaboration not only within our science DMZs, but also among us who are building science DMZs so that we can have things like best practices and you know all the other stuff that we want to do. So that's a lot of the best practice, a lot of the, the, the my thoughts about how we're going to secure the actual science DMZ. If we have a reasonably secure science DMZ, though, I think there's also a much more important thing we can do with it, which we can use it to help secure our network to a much greater extent. I'm going to talk about two scenarios, although I'm only really talk about the one scenario. The second scenario I've, I've written up in text, so you can just read through it. 
the first scenario is, is sort of imagine some scientific instruments, a lab, like an analytical facility or some sort of mass spec lab or something like that. You can see it's, I'm using an old thick net uh, ethernet here. The Visio has this nice icon for that. Um, because yeah, a lot of those old mass spec machines actually did use, and some, actually often they use thin net, um, which nobody else really used. And you would have to bridge it into the regular campus network, or you might have to have a machine here. What this machine here is doing is it's driving the, the instrument. It's managing the instrument, but it's also collecting data off of it. So the machine needs to be on the network so the data can then be exported to some other place, either across campus or around the world. Now, the problem is that you can't really patch this machine because it breaks the software that drives the instrument. This happens all the time on our campus. We see this a lot. And then the other problem is the instrument outlasts computers and operating systems quite a bit. I remember in a science lab, there was a mass spec machine, and the, the, the students brought in a, a little micro PDP-11 to drive it because that's what the mass spec machine used. And this was in 1999. Okay? I didn't even see a micro PDP-11 in a long time. I told them, hey, that thing's not Y2K compliant. They said, that's OK. We're just going to change the date to 1972. They didn't care. They wanted to use the mass spec machine. They didn't care what the operating system was running. It was probably running RT11 or something like that. So anyway, what often happens is you throw up a Linux or BSD box as a bastion host in front of this host, and you can still share data through it, maybe just bridging or firewalling or doing something like that. Um, but that doesn't scale very well, because now you have to have a whole bunch more Linux and BSD boxes on the network that are being managed, again, by grad students and, and or PIs trying to manage them and doing stuff like that. And, and um, I've actually had, by the way, really good system administrators who are also PIs, amazingly enough. Um, so, But sometimes, you know, grad students, since you draw the short straw, you have to be the sysadmin. So maybe instead of being the sysadmin, and maybe instead of using an expensive Linux or BSD box, you buy like a $20 Linksys router and you stick that in and you just NAT and because you're doing that it's now secure. And more importantly, more importantly your security group can't scan and see that there's that, that thing is running Windows XP back there and it's not supported anymore and it's not patched. Well of course when you have this what's going to happen is probably you, you get the version with the wireless router on it too because hey that's like that's like an extra bonus. So now I'll just sit there and I'll turn on the wireless and I'll use you know the grad students will all plug their laptops into the into the box or they'll just use the wireless here. They don't have to log in, do that pesky logging into the campus wireless. They don't have to get, make sure their edge room credentials are correct. And so they just simply start doing stuff. And now they're bringing their laptops in from home or from Starbucks, and they may be busily compromising this machine. So you end up with a whole bunch of mess behind this sort of thing. So what can we do? Well, if you build a DTN, and I've abstracted away. There's a science DMZ here. The DTN is just sitting there by itself with a big storage array behind it. Now imagine we do that, and now what we can do is just have this machine talk to the DTN either on an unrouted, either a routed within campus, but not routed beyond campus network, or just it's just heavily firewalled. And you can see I've put a firewall in here. This firewall is so big, it's almost as big as the entire campus network. Because all it's doing is blocking everything except what's going to the DTN. So now you have this bi-directional flow between the DTN and this, this otherwise um, non-patchable, vulnerable box. But it's basically being walled off to everything but the DTN. And then the DTN can share the data where it needs to be shared beyond the campus. What if that's not good enough? What if you want to actually air gap this scientific instrument? <clears throat> One way you can do it, and you can see what I've added here. This is just for, for you know, security's sake. I've added a, a, a IDS for the, the actual DTN slash science DMZ. There's a tap and an IDS. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put all the data on this storage array. Then I'm going to move physically move the storage array over here. I'll take the disks and move them over here. Now, wait, that's sneaker net. We're not supposed to do that. We're networking people, right? Well, I'd much rather have you take this across campus or across the data center than have you take it across the country or halfway around the world. The DTN is going to do all the heavy lifting for you. So you're not going to have to ship this via UPS. You can instead just walk it over to this part of the lab or this part of the data center from your lab. But OK, that doesn't scale very well. So what else can we do? We can do something like build a secondary network, keep this air gap from the main internet. We could build a fiber channel network, or we could build an iSCSI network that's separate. And we could use that network connection to take this box and mount a file system on this uh, array, and then unmount the file system when it's done pushing the data out. This guy then mounts the file system. So these are atomic operations, and then pushes all the data out. Another possibility, if you've got sensitive data, that works pretty well through data is not sensitive. If you've got sensitive data, 
You could do the same thing. Let's say this is an MRI machine that's taking pictures of people's brains. You can push the data out, unmount the file system, have this air-gapped encryptor device, which is, can be a, a Linux or BSD box with a bunch of encryption software on it, or there are people I know who are building like sort of um, make your own open source hardware HSMs, hardware open design, hardware, um, hardware design HSMs. And you can use that to encrypt what's on here and then unmount it and have the DTN mount it. That looks a little complicated, so you can actually do the whole thing in line. And in order to scale it, we can keep this in the data center. But if you're worried about the traffic going around the network, you know, through fiber patch panels with a lot of unencrypted HIPAA data, even though it's not hitting any active electronics, it's just going through fiber patch panels, we can still put this device and put it as an outboard device uh, on the machine that's driving the science instrument. Now, that doesn't scale quite as well. But again, if you can build a standard version of this encryptor device, which people are actually doing now, you can actually do the inline encryption, send the data up here. Now it's encrypted at rest. So if your DTN gets compromised at some point, it, it never sees the unencrypted data. So again, what you're doing is minimizing the risk on your DTN. And you're separating where the unencrypted data, keeping that sort of off in a walled garden, and putting the DTN stuff where there's low risk encrypted data or just low risk data. So again, what you see we're doing here in all of these cases is we're separating functions in the way that allows us to manage the risk in the maximum possible way. All right, that's scenario one. Scenario two is compute clusters. Very similar. One of the interesting things about this scenario is after I wrote it, I was talking to someone, and it turns out their compute cluster people are basically doing this model. They don't want the cluster to be anywhere near the public internet. So what they really want to do is, see a, is have a DTN. They're like, we want the DTN. We don't want us sharing data far away with other things where we have to leave that open. So we want the DTN to be completely separate from the cluster. So they're implementing this kind of thing. They've, they've already seen the value in doing that. That's very interesting. Well, risk mitigation is key. Sort of EE -E coming style there. Um, that's really what we're trying to do. And the way we mitigate risk the best is to separate the functions of the network so that our science DMZ is just doing science DMZ stuff. That way we can manage the risk and tailor the controls to the thing that we're trying to manage. And that's really the most important thing, I think, in all security, in all of your network security that you can do. Rather than just apply controls willy-nilly because they're cool, what you want to do is make sure you understand the risk and apply the controls that are best tailored to that risk. Thanks. Doesn't look like Nick has anything to add. So. He didn't text you, huh? All right, thank you very much, Michael. Um, does anyone have questions? I know we've eaten completely into the break, and I'll comment on that momentarily. Anybody have questions? All right, well, thank you very much. It was really uh, inspiring. I think that uh, as we go to implement science DMZs, uh, I think that we've got to pay attention to security up and down through it. Uh, defense in depth. So thanks very much, Michael. I think we'll, we'll all be interested in helping out because there'll be in some interesting things to do in the security realm. So look me up when you want.